to something greater in Jesus' name. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. It's good to see you, and I trust the Lord has been blessing. Please turn with me to Hosea chapter 6. In Hosea chapter 6, We are looking at verses 1 through 3 in the message, Critical Elements for Revival in Any Church. Critical Elements for Revival in Any Church. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will be, will he, after two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know. If we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Praise the Lord. Now that the election is over, I ask you, what do you think is the most important thing to get out of the pandemic, to control the pandemic, to be healed from the pandemic? Now that the election is over, you can tell we still need the help of God. We are poised at a crossroad. Church and citizens. Something has to happen. And that thing that must happen to make the change is not resting on the army of Israel. They may have the number, but they cannot cure the way God cures. They cannot heal the way God can heal. Would to God, Israel, at the first approach to God before the war, had asked the Lord, Lord, who did this thing? Because that's what Joshua, after a defeat, went to God. Who did this thing? What happened? And God told him. They should have asked God, who is the evil man? You think God didn't know those rapists? He didn't? He sure did. When you find a people that are not interested in what God has to say, you find a people that are running their head against the will of God, the way of God, the word of God. But today we are looking at critical elements for revival in any church, among any people in any nation. If the nation is totally heathen, these principles operate. If the nation is lukewarm, cold, or hot, this is the path to it. Revival is renewal. Revival is bringing to life the dead cold hearts by, quick, by the quickening of the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is the source and supplier of revival. The nation cannot be healed until the Spirit is released so much on the land that wicked men fall on their faces before the Almighty God. He is the Spirit of life and power, the Holy Spirit. Revival takes place individually, that is personally, every me and you individually, but the effect is seen corporately and nationally. Critical elements of revival are things individual Christians must practice and support if we are to experience and sustain revival in our life and church. Each member must embody all the critical elements to attract and retain revival. When each member is willing and ready to be instrument for God's use, revival is immediately given, made available. The psalmist in Psalm 80, Psalm 85 verse 6, he says, will thou not revive us? This is a psalm for the sons of Korah. Korah, they were singers, very good one too. But it got to a place there like, they were singing like, I guess the kind of choir that Charles Finney had in his church here in Manhattan, in Presbyterian, that their singing made no change. He was part of that choir and had to drop out because their singing did not even impact the singers. They sang for God that they have surrendered to God, but were not surrendered to his will. And so Charles Finney just got fed up and decided to go seek God. Thank God he found him. And so you find this, the songs of Korah, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? They were burdened. And so they desired that which God desired for them. The Holy Spirit must be desired. He must be requested. He must be appreciated. He must be honored and yielded to for us to attain any significant revival. He must no more, no longer be grieved, resisted, quenched, lied to, vexed, or not cooperated with. And so I need to talk to you about three things this morning. The first being the prerequisite for spiritual revival. The second being the practice for sustainable revival. That's when we're going to discuss those critical elements that every one of us must embody. And then finally, progress through spirits refilling. Number one, prerequisite for revival, for spiritual renewal. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us us up. God does judge his people. God does judge the nation. At this time, God has decided to issue one uniform judgment across the nations of the world such that there's no nation that is not taking measures to fight Coronavirus causing pandemic. 
It is the finger of God. Get it? It is the judgment of God. Don't deny it. You see, Israel that is saying, let us return. The Lord had warned them before. They didn't take heed. The Lord had gone ahead to execute judgment. You know, he can judge with disease, can judge with famine, economic downturn. He can judge any, with, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, trouble in the country, in the nation. But the people have to recognize what is going on for what it is. Israel ignored all of that. And God, all of the warning, and God just came down. Look at it. Hosea chapter 5. I don't know how much uh, far I can back up because I was just going to read the last two verses. Let's back up to verse 10 then. The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound, the boundary. God set lines and limits. You can't cross this line. The law is there. They ignored it. He says the princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandments. He willingly walked, crossed, the commandment. Therefore, will I be unto Ephraim as a moth. No, moths don't make noise. They eat precious garments and damage it. I'll be to Ephraim as unto uh, as a moth, and to the house of Judah as rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound. Then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jerob, yet could he not heal you, nor cure you of your wound. The announcement of vaccine against coronavirus cannot cure until God's judgment is addressed against the nations. And notice the pandemic affects the churches too. And notice the pandemic is shaking the hands of the church and they're losing the people that were following afar off, the people that were at the back, the weaklings that could not walk fast. They are dropping like flies. He says... They went to Assyria thinking there is solution from Assyria. And God says it, if it's the judgment of God, there is no balm in Gilead to turn it. But repentance. And so, he says, and sent to King Jerob, yet could he not heal you, nor cure you of your wounds. Verse 14, for I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. He says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offenses 
their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. The Lord expects the church to lead the nation back to God. The Lord expects the church to cry out for revival that the days of the pandemic will end. Israel acknowledged their suffering and their acknowledging was as a result of their their suffering, rather, was as a result of their backsliding and sin. And they did that which was prerequisite to spiritual renewal. They resolved to repent and return to the Lord. They were certain, they were sure the Lord will revive them again. You see, when sinners refuse to turn and ask God for mercy and revival, they tempt God to judgment. They tempt God, it's like they're telling God, oh yeah, that's all, go ahead. Will it make you comfortable to hear that God can do worse than what the pandemic what it is currently doing with the pandemic, more people can die. You know that? In fact, God can bring the economy of the powerful nations to zero. Since that's our focus. He can zero everything out. You better pick up your Bible and start reading. Money is not going to be the answer for everything. Look at all the trillions we've thrown at COVID-19. It has not even blinked an eye. It's surging. After this stimulus and that stimulus and that stimulus, it's surging. And when people, when fatality rate increases, that's the part the general citizens really don't, don't know. That all that God needs to do, since they pretend this, this is not getting their attention, some are even fighting against wearing a mask, all that God needs to do is move the fatality rate from wherever it is now to 20%. It will get everybody's attention. The fatality rate is less than, it's in a single digit, isn't it? And we're like, oh, this is bad, this is bad. What if God increases the fatality rate to 20%? You will not hide from knowing somebody that died from COVID. And by the way, my brethren, from my, my other, mother, other mother, I accept my sympathy on the dead and the passing away of uh, Rawlings, J.J. Rawlings. And I hope I didn't shock anybody if you didn't hear the news. Well, yeah, because uh, I think that he just lost the mother and then he has to follow. It's been around long enough, 73, isn't it? Okay. But getting back to this, if we don't turn with divine judgment, with warning, if we don't turn at the first salvo, there will be a second salvo. If we don't turn at the second salvo, there will be a third salvo. I say, God forbid. But God will only forbid that if we turn. When sinners refuse to turn and ask God for mercy and revival, they tempt God. And he knows and has the ability to do as he chooses. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 38, he says, 
he will purge the rebels. In Ezekiel 20, verse 38, And I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. I will not be surprised if the 40,000 people that died among the children of Israel, 40,030 people died in that conflict with Benjamin. I would not be surprised if they were all idolaters. Because God knows how to deliver his own, the righteous. And when you add the 26 or 25,000, uh, the army was 26,000. And now 25,000 and some died. And the 600 of them ran up to the Mount Rim. What happened to Mount Zion? Instead of Mount Zion, where the temple is, when you can go and repent, they went up to Rimnon. There was some idol altar there. But God says, I'm not limited by anything. I can porch. I can severe, I can cleanse. He can cut out the fruitless branches. He says in John chapter 15, verse, because I need to point this out to you before we get into this repentance proper. In John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15, Verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away Jesus' words. He takes away, he cuts it off. Then he purges and cleanses the one that are making some effort to bear fruit. And so no need to say he's not as perfect as Peter or Paul because... He's making some effort. God can help him. God can remove the things in his life, in her life, that limits her fruitfulness, his fruitfulness, and make him more fruitful. But what of you? If you're not doing anything, not bearing fruit at all, he will disconnect you. God does it. Verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. That's not your portion. So we know it can purge the rebels. It will just let them hear a sound and they run, and they take on the anti position, and they find themselves opposed to the truth while they think they are trying to fix this or fix that. So he can remove the fruitless branches and uproot foreign or strange plants. Did you hear Jesus say in Matthew chapter 15 to the hearing of those that they thought they belonged much more than Jesus himself and they opposed Christ. And so he said, in Matthew 15, 13, they answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be uprooted. Make sure you are planted in the house of God. And the people that are planted, let me show you before you are quick to answer to say you are planted. The people that you are planted, the scripture is clear who they are, and what they should be looking like or doing. In Psalm 92, verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. 
they are fruitful. The fruit is evidence that you are planted. Uh, let me back up to 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. I don't know about you. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Praise the Lord. And so he can porch the rebels, cut out fruitless branches of root, uh, strange and uh, foreign trees that were not planted by the Lord. But the, the righteous, uh, the, the ones that are planted there should be bearing fruit. And then he will reserve the tares and the bad fish for final judgment. Have you noticed that in Matthew 13, that he has those two groups that he says, leave them alone, they are waiting for final judgment. In Matthew 13, verse 24, and uh, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good uh, seed in his, in his field, and while men slept and did not pray, and while men slept and were not watchful, and while men slept and were agreeing to just every dick and Harry that shows up and calls himself a pastor and calls himself this, while men slept, what happened? His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And the two, the good seed and the uh, bad, the, uh, uh, the wheat and the tares, they grew together. And they were in the same fellowship. And you couldn't tell who was who because everybody is a, every man is a brother, every woman is a sister. But God knew who was there. And so those of you that are making excuses as to, well, there are too many hypocrites in the church. So I can't go to church, I can't give my life to Christ, I can't go serve God. You are in danger because God already knows about those people. And he knows how to deal with them. So because they are going to perish, is he also reserving you for the fire? No, you need to come in and get saved and repent. Praise the Lord. And the Lord himself, the Lord himself gave the explanation, the interpretation to the parable. You can read the rest of it yourself because he says, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tars are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them away. But that shall not be your portion. And then he gave another parable, that the kingdom is like a net that men cast, into the sea, verse uh, uh, 47, and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. It's not every fish the fisherman catches is a fish he can eat. The Lord himself is saying so. And so, we have to pay attention to those things, the kind of repentance that brings revival. That there will be real repentance, which must be followed by remission. 
Repentance and remission must precede regeneration and revival. It's not if, it's not maybe, it has to be so. In Isaiah 57, verse 15, for thus says the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones, the repentant ones. It says in Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was an urgent message. It was a pungent message. It was something that there is no alternative to it. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That is the revival Israel was waiting over 400 years for. That's the revival that was supposed to be permanent, supposed to be nationally transforming, supposed to be globally transforming. No wonder the Ethiopian, you know, was in Jerusalem around that time. And so he says, repent, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Praise the Lord. Jesus preached differently, right? No. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? So you see, repentance and remission must precede regeneration and revival. 1 Kings chapter 18 in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah confronts the nation. Elijah, not popular with the king. Elijah, hated by the queen of the land. Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, the people were totally given to idolatry. They accepted whatever Ahab was doing, whatever Jezebel was doing. And here, here is Elijah in verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? When are you going to give up your idolatry? When are you going to think that uh, there is more than one truth? When is the nation going to accept the absolute truth? And stop all this uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation. Because, you see, the people don't understand that when the leadership comes out to be sowing lies, and people buy that lie, it, prunes, it, it, prun, it, it, it kind of primes them up to ignore absolute truth. It's worse than creating a church to preach error. They know if they do that, the people, the so-called Christians that support them now will oppose them, will attack them. So they don't come that way. They come just doing the regular uh, national social stuff, the political stuff, but undermining truth in its very essence. And the people that su su subscribe to truth back it up and they pray for it. You see how Satan gets people? And so Elijah came to the nation and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? 
if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. They just ignored him. Say, this ignorant man, what does he know? Verse 40. What Elijah was gunning for was total extermination of, of, of false worship in the nation. And so in verse 40, and Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let, them, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. <laughs> we don't do that these days. But if we pray, God can do worse than that. I mean, again, sin. Even the worst condition any church or nation, even in the worst conditions, any church, any nation can be revived if there are people flourishing in the critical elements that we're going to be talking about. How do I know that? The scripture informs us about that. You remember that passage in Ezekiel chapter 37 in verse 4. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, dried, scattered, disjointed, dead bones. Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, America, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinus upon you, and will bring off flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinus and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon this slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came unto them, and they revived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are not, we are cut off for our parts. Have you noticed recently it's like most of our pastors and teachers and brethren uh, they're talking about the church needing revival. Oh, we need revival. But they talk like they're expecting it from somebody else. They labor from somebody else. It's, I mean, no, none is broken and to say, I am the one that is the trouble. It's like we are telling other people to do things we are not ourselves willing to do. That's not how revival comes. Therefore, prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, this is where I have hope, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. 
And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. The Lord has spoken. He will perform it for us. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I say praise the living God. Amen. We see it in the New Testament. That's how we know that. So you wouldn't say, well, that was Old Testament. Acts chapter 2. He put it together for us also. Verse 36. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Is he Lord and Christ in your life? Is he Lord and Christ in your family? Is he Lord and Christ where you are sitting there? Is he Lord and Christ in the nation? What's your answer? Now, <laughs> excuse me. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart because they recognized that the Lord Jesus wasn't Lord and Christ in their heart. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your brethren and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from these untoward generation. Praise the Lord. Is our generation untoward? I'm asking you. America is your heaven, right? Is this generation untoward? Praise the Lord. Oh, you want to answer me like Isaiah? <laughs> or, 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 or as Ezekiel? God as Ezekiel. Son of man, can this bone live? He said, only you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you have in mind. I'm not giving the answer. Oh, praise the Lord. You see, what you're seeing here in Acts chapter 2 is telling us something that happens when revival breaks out. Something that happens when a group of people have prevailed with heaven. To bring the fire down. All that ran away when he was arrested. When Jesus was arrested, they returned. All that mocked him, they returned. All that denied him, Peter, they returned. All that went fishing, they returned. All that went to Emmaus, they returned. They all got revived. The Lord will bless us. Amen. I say the Lord himself will bless us in Jesus' name. And that's why we need to quickly get to this issue of the critical things that every one of us, from pulpit to pew, critical elements for revival in any church, practical uh, practices for sustainable Revival. Let's get, get back to Hosea. We're looking at verse 2. After three days, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. After two days, rather, will he revive us. In the third day, after two days, that means he puts you on the third day. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Praise the Lord. There is hope. Amen? Anywhere you find scriptural Holy Spirit inspired revival, you will find these critical elements 
in the members. Notice you've had verse 1 before verse 2. In verse 1, they say, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. Healing is coming, Amen. but we must turn. Healing is promise, but we must turn. Notice it says, after two days, by the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his side. Why is the third day critical here? Why is third day something important for revival? It's the resurrection. It's like Hosea was seeing and prophesying towards Christ being raised the third day. We've gone through one set of group fasting and prayer. How well is that going? Mothers, how well is that going? We are in the midst of another fasting and prayer. We'll probably just have, you know, uh, what, three or four weeks left. Can we prevail at this time, after two days, after two sets of fasting, and make sure revival breaks out? Or do we need another one in the spring? The truth is this. God is perfect. He doesn't need to change. It's we that need the change. And so, let's make sure that we do our part. In Acts chapter 2, practices for sustainable revival, verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Everyone in the church, everyone praying, everyone involved with our fasting and prayer, should be soundly saved. Must be soundly saved. We recommend that it's a requirement for you to join in the fasting and prayer. You know, as a babe in the Lord, I remember being sent to join the prayer warriors in one of our programs. And the sister that was leading, as she got on her knees to start leading us to pray, she just stopped and announced, if your life is not right, your marriage is not right, your that and that and that is not right, you must leave now. We can't start praying until you leave. And shut down the thing. Half the people were gone before we started to pray. Just think about that. Deeper life. That's who we are. But now, anything goes. And then we talk about revival like it must come from Florida. Who to God it should come from Florida? Anyway it comes, the nation needs it. The word of us. And so, Peter says there has to be genuine salvation and then there has to be baptism of the Holy Ghost after baptism with water and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call and uh, with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourself from this untoward generation then they that gladly received his word were baptized. There were some people that did not receive it gladly. But at least 3,000 people gladly received his word. And they were baptized. And the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 
how Peter must be rejoicing. Because you see, when they, when they counted all the people that gave their life to Christ, Peter knew that it's not all of them that their names are written in the book of life. The thing is, when he got to heaven, and it was, I mean, after he was gone, and the Holy Ghost, the, the Luke was going to write this uh, letter to Theophilus, that the Holy Ghost now tells Luke, put the number down. There were 3,000 of them. That is not the total number of people that listened to Peter that day. There were 3,000 of them. We don't know whether the Ethiopian you know was in Jerusalem. It may have been because chapter 2 is not too far from chapter 8 of Acts. And he was convinced by the people in the temple that they are the rightful owner of the religion. That he came to worship the true God. That the rightful owner of the uh, custodian of the true God. And the man finished his worship in Jerusalem and did not get saved. Until on his way home, when he ran into Philip, who was one of those that caught the fire. Praise the Lord. And so, beloved, watch this. Pay attention to this. And uh, they that gladly received his word were baptized. You find a church that people don't gladly receive the word. They always have something to say against it. If it's too short, it's too short. If it's too long, it's too long. If it's this other balded man, they say we want the one with the gray hair. Make up your mind. What is it you want? Is it the word of God? Is it God? Or you want convenience? And so these people, they were joyful to have the word preached to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They didn't have a Bible. And so it's what Peter says they write down. That's what controls their life. That's what they remember. That's what rules their life. And they, they, contru and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and uh, fellowship. Nobody is keeping himself away. Nobody needs the nation to come and beg them. Nobody needs, uh, you know, oh, don't mind them. These are, you know, when, when, when you get to, I hope you get there. Have you heard recently people just die like fly? It hasn't gotten to you yet? I mean, the news, not you dying. Amen? And in breaking of bread and in prayers. In prayers. 8.30 Sunday evening, you show up. Fasting Saturday, you show up. Night vigil, you show up. No, the, the church that even heads of department don't go for night vigil. Why? Who told you you deserve a revival? Who told you you deserve deliverance? Oh, just because God hasn't started... Cutting people like he did in Ananias and Sapphira makes you think God can be tempted? Let's return to the fear of God. The revival may come our way. And fear came upon every soul. What is the fear of God? And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. They say, ah, this one doesn't do the miracle. <laughs> Why? Who is there to receive, uh, receive the miracle? The undeserved? Haven't you seen Jesus go walk to the... Uh, uh, to that pool in Siloam, uh, uh, to, uh, sorry, walk uh, uh, to that uh, pool in Bethesda, and uh, so many impotent folks, a lot of people all littered the place, waiting for the move of the water, and he just walked to one man alone and healed that person and was satisfied and left. Just think about that. Did he hate the other people? Oh, we can ask him when you get over there. Hope you make it. And so, fear came on upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and departed them to all, to all men, as every man had need. And they continued how often? And they continued how often? 
daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church the Lord himself added to the church how often daily such as should be saved that means the church was preaching daily chapter 4 verse 32 and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, that's unity. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Not just the leaders, everybody had grace. You know, a church, a group of people that don't even have grace to be quiet when they should just shut up. No grace. No grace. The grace they say they have does not control their hand to send out insulting tweets, email, or texts. Watch it. When you get to a point that you feel nobody can control you, watch it. You may be next to falling off the cliff. Because no human being should act like that. The president is controlled by the Congress and by the people that voted him in. In one word, it's not, it's not written that you can go and slap the president. No, you shouldn't do that. You pay, you pay with your life if you do that. Because those FBI guys, they will shoot you before they think. But he's not allowed to oppress the people in any form. So I'm not just talking American, I'm talking gospel now. That's what the Bible says. He that ruled over men must must, not may or should, must be what? Just. And so, here you have the people of God sharing, and the grace was everywhere. The person in the pew had grace. Grace to endure five hours of teaching or preaching. Grace to sit through an entire retreat message or entire retreat period from Thursday to Sunday without, not, to, not uh, uh, I'm rushing over there. And it's like you're begging a pastor to attend to retreat. Pastor. You give out this and they're like, oh, you know, uh, uh, please, I'm going to be coming late. Can I move my message? <laughs> That's the rule I want revival. And then, you go over there, uh, everybody has their own thing. Choir, what's going to happen? I don't have anybody to sing. <laughs> okay, so what happened to their voice? I hope God doesn't take their voice from them for playing games with God. Because we're asking you to worship him. Asking you to, you have the privilege that many billions don't have to come lead us to worship him. This is how revival works. It costs people something. Some 100% of their life. Some 60% of their time. Some 30%. But everybody has something he commits to it. And so, it says here, Neither was there any among them that lacked. This one always blesses me. No matter how much you sacrifice and commit to it, you are not going to lack. For as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them, anything that was going to distract them, they just get it off and brought the prices of the things that were sold and let them down at the apostles' feet. At the apostles' feet. Nobody's calling IRS. Nobody's calling, asking for accounting. Nobody's, wow, this is hard grace. And let them down, the apostles' feet, and contribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Think about it. And Joseph, 
They give us an example of somebody that did that. When you look at that, you're likely to think that you understand it all. I believe God you do. But permit me to single out a few critical things from those two passages for us to look at a little closer. Number one, profitable unity. People are involved in all kinds of body. They are engaged with their employer. They are united with their co-worker in order for that business, that employment, to achieve its purpose. They are uniting, cooperating with somebody there. In their family, they are uniting and cooperating in the family. Otherwise, if one person brings in income for general use, and the other person feels all his or her income is for their own personal use, how is it going to work in the family? Well, the, the other person is the billionaire. Of course, it will work. You will notice it. But I'm sure the other person that is bringing in everything is going to notice that the other one that is not is selfish. And that's not unity. That's not how it's supposed to work. We are supposed to have profitable unity in the church. That, that is, is profitable to every member, to everyone. It shouldn't be one-sided, just flowing from one in one direction. Everybody has something to give. Unity in the church comes after all her members have union with Christ and his members. You should have union with Christ and union with the members of the body of Christ. When once that has taken place, unity is in place. But the reason that there is division and disunity is because many don't have that union with Christ. And we're trying to preach them into unity when we're not pressuring them to unite with Christ. Somebody says something to your hearing. That a born again person cannot say. You don't tell the person you are not born again. It's not to go and preach to the other person that they are attacking. Who by the grace of God is that? It's you telling that person you are not born again. Born again people don't do this. You are in danger for your life. Unity has to come only after there is union with Christ. And that's when you have unity that profits all. All members are separated from the world and united together without waiting for who should start first. You see that chapter 2? It says in verse 1 that they were united and subsequently keeps repeating it. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Listen to me. We are not the only one that Satan is attacking. Satan was attacking them too. Wasn't he? So we can't make excuses. It says in verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. It was a dispersed generation, was a wicked generation. But they were united. But they were together. Praise the Lord. It says in verse 44, And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and parted them to all, as every man has need. Verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. In the United States, because of the social condition of the place, And the legality of some people, 
You know, somebody just dropped by from Africa the other day, and then uh, you go, you just stop by with that announcement, and uh, you know, I just wanted to say hello. He said, wait a minute, you're still a Bushman? You know, this is America. You don't go to anybody's house without first calling and getting pe exit and permission. permission. So you're like, I was just trying to uh, be Bible. Okay, don't be Bible. You know, you're in America. America is superior to Bible. And if you encourage it too much, and then the man starts going to that woman, he knows that the husband is not there, and, that, and they, they start talking nonsense, doing nonsense. And then not going becomes a holier thing than going because of what they do. In chapter 4, verse 32, he says, and the multitude of them that believed were, notice it's all the people that believe we're talking about. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. That's real unity. One heart, one soul. Neither said any of them that out of the things which he possessed was his own. But they all had all things common. And we have a fellowship that if I stood you up now and say, how much do you earn per year? You say, ah, pastor, nobody asks anybody about his income. We don't reveal that. That's a secret. Secret, really? That's Christianity. That's secret too. And the reason they hide is because they don't want you to know what to expect of their tithes. So if you hide from man, doesn't God know? Will he not waste the, what belongs to him that you refuse to bring to his house? Learn to understand God and understand him well. He says in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all one accord in, uh, all one accord in Solomon's pouch. And Jesus actually took time to pray for the church to be united. John 17, verse 11, And now, I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. The church membership is supposed to be united among members as Christ is united with the Father. Have you thought about that? The Trinity, nothing shakes them. Trinity, Nothing makes them despise one another. Trinity. The enemy can lie and do whatever. Trinity is intact. And Jesus says the Father should do that for us. Verse 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be one, made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou has loved me. When the church sits down and expects, or a member in the church is the other person that is supposed to come unite with me. And sometimes the arrogance is so high, it's the pastor that needs to come down and burn down. Because when he preached, he offended me. And so he's the one to come and kneel down and apologize and unite with me. No. Learn something. We unite with the head. If we cut off your head, are you alive? Praise the Lord. And so you notice that perf profitable unity there. The other thing you notice in the early church, which are critical for revival, is perfect love. That's why Jesus commanded that they should love one another. And the example was how he has loved them. By the way, there is no unity without agape love. Agape love that makes you ignore this damage, this damage, this damage. You see, the people that hurt people, a lot of them, they don't even think of what they've done. They don't, they don't even consider what they have done. You know, 
you walk around, you're insulting somebody's a little child. He's four years old. You're insulting the father of that child and fighting and battling against that father. And then you don't even think of that little boy. You finish, you go, you forget everything. But that little boy gets scared emotionally because it happened in a church that preaches love and holiness. And you feel you've done nothing wrong. You really, you have not done anything wrong. And so, perfect love is something you see there in that early church. What else did we see there? Powerful faith. People were moving in faith. The people that sold their land and gave everything to the church, they were not like fretting over, ah, what am I going to eat tomorrow? They know as long as they're engaged in that work, the Lord will take care of them when the time comes. They know that God will not allow their need to surpass their hand that their hand will be sufficient for them. And so they operated in faith. Doesn't the Bible say, but without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must, must, Hebrews 11, 6, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Praise the Lord. Faith the size of mustard seed is sufficient to bring a mighty revival. And the other thing we see there was that while all that multitude was mingling and going on and the fellowship was going on, there was purity, penetrating holiness, which Peter says is based on obedience. And so he says, as obedient children... As obedient children, obeying, because if you, there's an area of the word of God you don't obey, you cannot claim to be holy. But as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance, but as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And then what else do we see there? We see proper doctrine. Real doctrine. Doctrine that will make a sinful man, a sinful woman in the congregation very uncomfortable until they repent. That's when they begin to enjoy the church. A lot of people are delaying their repentance and so they are miserable people. Let's call it what it is. You can't enjoy the presence of God. If there's one soul there that is born again and is praying, <laughs> even if he doesn't preach, you'll be uncomfortable. You walk inside there and you're like, hey, what kind of place is this? And of course, you always find something to complain about. I don't, you complain about the color of the chair. You complain about the height of the chair. You complain about the tie, the tie of the usher. You complain about the lady in red. You complain about the lady in white. You complain about the time in the club. You complain about the uh, video and the audio. You complain about... <laughs> what does he want to complain about? And the owner of the church is just looking at you from the throne in heaven. <laughs> And he said, look at this one. I had mercy to draw you to my presence to save you. And all you're busy doing is talk. You're supposed to hear the word. Let it enter your ear and heart and make you whole. And the word will take effect in Jesus' name. Amen. And so proper doctrine is required. And you hear them there. He says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Praise the Lord. And then there was proficient preaching. As Ezra, there was proficient preaching. You see, Apollos had to be redirected because in the early church, their focus was very sharp on proficient preaching. And so, 
while uh, Apollo was there and was preaching and sweating, the Holy Ghost told Aquila and Priscilla, you need to fix that guy. Because there's work for him in Ephesus, there's work for him in Corinth, there's work for him in the, God, in the kingdom of God. He has to have his preaching right. Paul wasn't there, Peter wasn't there, but God found Aquila and Priscilla to fix Apollos. That didn't take Apollos' position from Apollos. It only made Apollos better. He only makes, made Apollos, by the time he got to the church in Corinth, a powerful, powerful, powerful witness for Christ. And great things happened in Corinth. The, a revival needs proficient preaching. And this is also one of the things we need to ask God to open our eyes. When we read the Bible, that we see something we have not seen before. Because there's a temptation to think you know the Bible. Particularly those of us that regularly read from Genesis to Revelation. But that you have the joy to sit down and just glean, discern, exegete, get understanding. For your good and the good of the body. It is a requirement for real revival. Effective preaching is ba based on sound doctrine. Deficient doctrine eventually withers the tree. The tree would, would not have any nutrient to stand. That is the tree that God planted in the church. Praise the Lord. And that's why when Paul is writing to the bishop in Ephesus, in this his second letter to the bishop in Ephesus, he tells he wants him, he wants him to preach the word. I charge thee. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine all in one sermon. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We are in that time. But after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And so you see, sound doctrine was a feature in the revival in the early church. And so also was prevailing prayer. Prayer that gets to its destination. Prayer that opens heaven. Prayer that brings the promised blessings. In Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. The prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigionoth. Verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. This is the prophet himself. God was sending him to others. And he was trembling at the word that he heard himself. He wasn't praying like to other third party. He himself saw himself. Inside it. He says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. He was pleading with God for the fire to fall because he was part of it. He was crying out. 
And Jesus says, the way we ask for revival is not this, give me one cookie, give me a second chocolate. It's a, something that burdens you, that bothers you, that makes you want to sacrifice until you see it happen. It is you that needs to start it. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, stood and cried, stood and cried. You know, you know that most of the time Jesus was teaching, he was sitting. But when something serious like this uh, he's going to talk about, he stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, this, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this said, spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Praise the Lord. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles', apostles doctrine and in breaking of bread and uh, in what? In what? In prayers. In prayers. In prayers. And the scripture gives us an example that if Elijah could pray down revival in Israel with all the idolatry. We can with the name of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Can we? <laughs> I didn't even hear a groan from some section of the congregation. I asked, can we pray down revival? Quiet, so quite silent. I'm asking again, can we pray down revival? Those of you backbenchers back there, where you think I don't see your face. <laughs> Can we pray that revival back here? You know, I'm looking for a voice. When we go for prayer, he will put up, instead of putting his name so that, or his face so that we can see him, he will put there, my Redeemer. I'm asking you, can we pray down revival in this place? Amen. 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 You know, me and you, you, you know, we are in this together. Amen. I'm not retiring until that fire falls so mighty that the glory of Christ will be restored in the nation. And so you see, they were busy in prayer. And the passage I was trying to tell you, it says that Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain because he needed the attention of the nation. He needed to tell them, you need revival. You need God to come solve your problem. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again and the earth and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. There will be revival in this place. But we cannot pray as if it doesn't concern us. Don't pray as a spectator. Pray as a, particip a participant. You see, I read to you where Habakkuk is asking for revival. But look at him. To show you he was himself. He, he, he considered himself part of the people. And every intercessor, we're going to be talking about intercessor uh, one of these days. Every intercessor has to be part of the people if it's going to be effective. You can have, like a, a, a brother was talking about earlier, this holier-than-thou attitude. And I, I think if I recall, he even read from the scripture from Isaiah 65 to us. Is that right? Amen? But look at Habakkuk in chapter 2. He says, I will stand upon my watch. He's not just telling people, you know, you guys need to go get revival. No, he's part of it. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. <laughs> he, he says, I am not all that. I know he's going to come tell me you're not all that. So I'm already, I'm waiting for that. Praise the Lord. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. And make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end of uh, at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though though it tarry, wait for it, because 
It will surely come. It will not tarry. The vision will speak in this place. Praise the Lord. You see, all these attract revival. And all these are also evidence of revival. The things that bring revival are the things that sustain revival. They cannot come. One person brings it. And then everybody's doing as they please because they don't regard the king and think that they have a revival. It didn't work back then. It's not going to start working now. Before we leave, I need to remind you of the great progress we can make in a revival. You know, as I go to Lagos and I see some of the brethren that held on over the years, and I really thank God for everyone, then I recall that life was not always as grand as it is for some of our leaders now. There were leaders back then that for a whole week, they, do, they may not have food in their house. And there was no kitchen to supply daily meals back then. And they still endured. They suffered. They suffered to raise a holy church that you now claim to be a member. And it has cost you nothing. And you won't even let it cost you anything. But you see, all their labor has brought the fruit that we now have. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, he's going forth, he's prepared as the morning. Read the rest of that verse for my, to my hearing, please. Out loud. And. I think you're going to need to read the whole verse. Because some people didn't read it when we say, let us read. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Let's go. And it shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. The Lord is telling us, any rainfall we have missed, he will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. You see, rainfall, is a recurrent event. Otherwise, there will be no harvest. You can't have rain once, maybe during the planting, and no rain again and expect a harvest. You can't have rain at the end of the season and was dry all along. Would you have grown your crops? No. And so the Lord is giving us this imagery of the rain. Like you notice in the book of Acts, those that got baptized on the day of Pentecost, they kept getting refills, refills, refills. There will be dryness without rain or only one time rain. So there was Pentecost in Jerusalem. It started with a small group of fearful people and engulfed thousands quickly. It kept reoccurring since then. 
Every time you turn, you see it happening. It kept going on and going on and going on and going on. In Acts chapter 1, they started gathering together to seek the Lord. In verse 12, then returned there unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath, day, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where both Peter, where about both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and uh, Thomas, Bartholomew and uh, Matthew, James the son of Alphius and uh, Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. They mention the apostles, they list out the apostles. These all continued with one accord, unity was preeminent, in prayer and supplication with the women, with the women. The women had noticed they are not listed there. And uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the only woman mentioned by name there, and with his brethren. Of course, it has to be there because she's now under the custody of John, the divine. The Apostle John. So, so apparently John just takes her everywhere he goes. And in those days, Peter rose up and then they feel the missing, the, the, 12, the position of the twelve. But the thing I'm trying to show you here is that they worked for the revival. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were still there. They were still there. And they suddenly they came, the mighty, the sound of, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. This wasn't like Samaria, that Simon the sorcerer couldn't get it. And they appeared unto them, cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled, all of them filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Praise the Lord. Amen. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized and the same day were added unto the church. To the church, the Spirit was flowing, the people were getting converted. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you go to uh, chapter, uh, what is it now? Chapter 4, uh, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. They were filled in chapter 2. The miracle took place in chapter 3. Chapter 4, they are refilled again, because rain doesn't fall only once in a day. Only once in a year. Only once in its growing season. Praise the Lord. They kept getting refills because they maintained the critical elements among them. The unity, the love, the faith, the holiness, the uh, proper doctrine, the proficient preaching, and the prevailing prayer. If the fellowship was always together. Praise the Lord. Amen. And, and so... Because of that, because that was prevalent in Jerusalem, anybody that left Jerusalem, whether because of persecution or for any reason, carried the fire with them. And everywhere they got to, there was a refilling. There was an outpouring. When they got to Samaria, look at it in chapter 8. When they got to Samaria, verse 8, it says, And there was great joy in that city. Why? The sinners were getting converted. The gangsters were being pulled off the streets. And, the, you know, the armed robbers and the, the, everybody. You know, there was sudden peace in, in Samaria. There was sudden joy in the place. And the place was, uh, they, they just broke into joy. There was great joy in that city. Praise the Lord. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might do what? That they might do what? Oh, you're not following again. Where are you? Are you still here? 
The malls are not open. No, I don't know. Well, maybe they are open where you live. You know. Are you back here now? Praise the Lord. Okay. And so, and so read out what I was expecting you to fill out for me. That they might receive the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. For as yet it was fallen upon none of them. Only Philip had it. Uh, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Salvation is powerful, you know. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Everywhere they were sending it to. When it got to Antioch, when they got to Antioch, it was the same thing. Chapter 11. Chapter 11. In, uh, in Acts chapter 11, uh, uh, here, let's pick it up from mm, where? 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. When, who, when he came and has seen the grace of God in the church, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was, this Barnabas, he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the, unto the Lord because you have the man full of the Holy Ghost. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek for Saul. And they were there and brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch because the people in Antioch saw them doing the things only Jesus can do. When Paul got to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, you know, he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? They said, what's that? We haven't even said it. Holy what? So unto what were you baptized? Water? He said, water is not enough. Water just gets you out of your sin and uh, uh, just uh, symbolizes your repentance and uh, forsaking of all sin. Uh, you need to be filled with the Spirit. He prayed with them. He laid hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came down. When he got to the Cornelius house, uh, Peter wasn't that much willing, you know, for some, uh, for, for some reason. And, uh, 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 but somehow God prevailed. God showed him. God told him, the Holy Ghost told him to go. He went, he preached, not preaching like giving altar call, not preaching like saying you need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not preaching like saying we need, you need, we need revival in the church and in the nation and so on and so forth. No, 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 not, not as much as that. He was just preaching the regular resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, while he was speaking, while he was uh, preaching, while he was uh, teaching, as Peter spake this word, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Because God will always have his way. Amen? How many of you know that God will have his way? And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. You see, the fire of revival has spread from Jerusalem to many cities in Asia Minor. Born by people on fire, people like Philip, who brought joy to Samaria, like Barnabas, who brought a great blessing to the church in Antioch, or like Paul, who oversaw all those churches. The local people never resisted the fire. You know, sometimes we labor and we spend and be expended, seriously, to get a general superintendent here. And all the people just want is the show. He comes, he preaches, he, he will rebuke and correct. And it's like after he leaves, never <laughs> mind Jesus, he always talks like that. We're, we're even happy he didn't cry. How does, what kind of people are that? These other places that the apostles went to, everybody was ready to receive. Are you ready? I didn't hear you. The local people never resisted the fire. All the believers involved in the first century did everything to maintain the revival. 
You couldn't question them on the issue of unity. You couldn't question them on the issue of uh, leadership. You couldn't question them on the issue of, uh, uh, you know, by the time you go to Corinthians and they start questioning Paul, you're already removed from that initial this thing. You're far off on the other side. You're almost like 90 something years, 90, year, 90 years away, uh, and so on and so forth. But those original people, you know, they just continued to practice the things that brought the revival as they were commanded. They continued to hunger and to thirst, uh, you know, uh, for the spirit. They paid attention to study of the word and prayer, to love, uh, to holiness, to unity, and to faith. If you nurse the little cloud, it will lead to a desirable storm. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If you nurse the cloud, what will you get? If you nurse the cloud, let me ask you again. What will you get? You're not answering me. Praise the Lord. You know, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 39, you know the encounter between Elijah and Israel, and Ahab and Jezebel and all that. And when all the people saw it, saw the fire fall, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Praise the Lord. That's very good. Could they maintain it? Could they get back to God to get refilled? The Lord, he is the God. Praise the Lord. Verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. A long time ago, I told you, church, that there is a sound of abundance of rain. That was before COVID came. Do you still remember? Amen? Maybe COVID is just here long enough for God to get the people's attention. There is a sound of abundance of rain. Praise the Lord. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees, praying, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea, and, be, and he went up, and looked and said, there is nothing. There is nothing. The servant didn't know how to nurse the little cloud that was going to become a big storm. He went up and he said, there is nothing. And he said, go again. And he went, there is nothing. Go again, seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand, one hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariots, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Prophet was nursing the little cloud, nursing it, milking it, and the storm came. But the storm doesn't come before the fire. The storm comes after the fire. You prevail with God and the fire falls, then it's followed by the storm. But you see, the unfortunate thing, and the reason I'm emphasizing this before we pray, is that if we are not conscious of what we are doing to bring down revival, we are going to get careless even when it is there. And then there are occasions in the church that we come to service and the Spirit of God is like so weighty in our midst. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Hello? Answer me. Well, if you've never fe felt it, don't lie. You, you can just say, thou know it. Hmm. But the people don't nurse that little cloud. 
to bring forth the storm. Elijah's people did not maintain their revival. They did not cherish it. It was a one-time event for them. We thank God for the book of Acts. It wasn't a one-time event for them. You know, in chapter 19, Elijah had to run for his life. Because the people that shouted, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is the God. We were there. It is in the cave that God now came to tell Elijah there are 7,000 people that have not gone into idolatry in the land. That's a big church. That's a mega church. Why didn't they come together? Can you imagine 7,000 people gathering together to shout the Lord, he is God? Jezebel will run out of the country. She will, be not, she will not be there to threaten the life of the prophet. But the 7,000 did nothing. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, where is it now? I was just going to read maybe a verse or two. And he, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have gone back into idolatry. The children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altar that he repaid on Mount Carmel, and slain the prophets that were left with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. And the Lord is like, Elijah, I need to still teach him something. All right, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And uh, the people that want revival I need to pay attention closely. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle. In their generation, you're not supposed to look at God. And went out and uh, stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go and return into the wilderness. Let's round up your ministry. Listen to this very carefully. By the time Elijah was taken up in 2 Kings, carried by the chariots of fire, and the people are still sitting down there under Ahab, say, eh, there's no revival in the church. There's no revival in the church. He brought it. You couldn't hold it. By the time Elijah was taken up, carried by chariots of fire, only one person, Elisha, was available and hungry and ready for the power. Available and hungry. Remember, Elijah tells Elisha, I'm going to Jericho, don't bother yourself. Just stay here. I'll be right back. No, they didn't say he was going to be back because you know he was going. Elisha said, no, I'd rather go with you. They go to Gilgal. And as he got to Gilgal, he said, hmm, how do I shake this man? You know what? I'm going from Gilgal to Jericho. 
So follow me. Uh, so stay here. Don't bother following me. You've already worked hard enough. You know, you're good. You're, good. you're doing well. And Elisha said, no, I'm going with you. And each way there was somebody to discourage him, the sons of the prophet. There was somebody to tell him he's over. There was somebody to, it's like, you can't fit in his shoes. Why are you bothering following Elijah? They got to Jericho. He says, I'm going to Jordan. Ah. Hmm. Who among us here, let me ask now, is actually hungry for real revival in this church? I mean a revival that will impact New York City and impact the nation. Let me see your hand up. Really, really, really serious about it. Where are you? Put your hand down. What is there? You are rate limiting step that if you have, if that happens to you, you will rather forsake the revival, abandon the church, abandon the work, and go away. Answer for yourself. Where is that line you have drawn for yourself? If they touch me, if they do this, this and that, and that, and that I'm not going to take it. Where are you? For Elisha, this man barely talked to him. And so he's ready to leave him off in Jericho to go to Jordan. He says, no, I'm not staying. I'll go with you. It's inconvenient. I'll go with you. There's no food. I'll go with you. There's no payroll. I go with you. They, and then they got to Jordan. And God has a way of confirming your faith if you've made up your mind. The Lord will encourage you. He will strengthen you. He will provide for you. You know when they, when they got to Jordan? I don't know whether it, even, it couldn't have crossed Elisha's mind because the idea of the trip, the plan, the plan stops, were not his. It was all Elijah, and Elijah wasn't telling him, besides, I'm, this is where I'm going. So they got to Jordan, and all of a sudden, the river is doing its job in, in its natural setting. And they need to get to the other side. And the man just takes his mantle. He hasn't done that miracle before. And just, bam, on the water. <laughs> and the water was like, oh, sorry, sir, we didn't know you were here. And parted this way, and parted this way, and it says, Elijah, okay, let's go. <laughs> I can just imagine Elijah walking, Elisha walking with Elijah through that Jordan and wondering in his head, this is the miracle I would have missed if I didn't insist to go with him. This is what I would have. And they get to the other side, and out of nowhere, why are you following me? What can I do for you? Say it now, because I'm gone. Hey! He said, without thinking, the man has been praying for revival. He has been praying for it. So he knows what he's getting. Without having to stop to swallow saliva, he says, I want a double portion. Hey, a double portion, a double portion. That's Pentecost. That's the portion of the firstborn. A double portion of your spirit is, ah, um, I'm not sure I, I was given clearance from heaven. But if you see me, <laughs> if you see me when I'm taken, are you going to see me? If you are faithful, if you are still there, if you are still seeking, if you are still hungry, if you are still ready when I'm taken, and all of a sudden, the chariots of fire it was a man of fire. Came, boom, and carried Elijah. And, they, and all of a sudden, the mantle that divided the Jordan fell right in front of him. And he turned. And the rivers, the waters of Jordan, were still going. <laughs> and he carried the mantle. Where is the God of Elijah? And the God of Elijah said, I'm still here. And it, Jordan divided. First miracle. Amen. Amen. 
and he went over. He was the only one that was left after the Mount Carmel revival. 7,000 people silent by Jezebel. But the thing that bothers me is that the event of Mount Carmel was never repeated again. Not again in Elijah's time, not again in Elisha's time. One opportunity. One opportunity. And today is that day that you must utilize that opportunity. We live presently in the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. That the days will come that he will pour out his spirit. And Joel said it, and it took so many years, but the people in us of the apostle got it. Real Pentecost. And we can have it too. Who is hungry? Who is thirsty? Come and drink. Come and drink. Get up on your feet. Come and drink. The Lord said you should come and drink. Open your heart. It's going to start with us returning to the Lord. And the rain will come. The Lord will make bright clouds. And there shall be showers of blessing. Come and drink. The thirsty, come and drink. Come and drink. That out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Come and drink. That as Elijah and Elisha, as you take over from Elijah, the power will be present immediately. The grace will be sufficient immediately. The glory will be present immediately. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to hear you pray. Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival, start the work in me. Thy words declare Thou will supply a need Say your blessing now O Lord I am Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. 
Then shall we know. If we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And it shall come unto us as the rain. As the latter and the former rain unto the earth. The rain. The rain. The rain. Pick up that little cloud the size of a man's hand and nurse it to a storm and let the rain fall in the name of Jesus Christ. Observe all the prerequisite, the foundation of true repentance with remission of sins and revival among the people of God. Tell the Lord, send forth thy spirit. Tell the Lord, keep your promise to the church. Tell the Lord, refill us again. Tell the, for those of you that had it before, tell the Lord, tell the Lord, we want it to impact the whole church. We want it to impact this, this city. We want it to impact this nation. In the name of Jesus Christ, can I hear your voice in prayer? Can I hear your voice in prayer? Because this is corporate prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ. Are you not tired wearing a mask? Are you not tired wearing a mask? I'm not saying you need to take it off. I mean that you need the land to be healed so that there will be no need for a mask anymore. Are you not tired of isolation? Are you not tired of missing one another? Are you not tired of this prevention or that prevention? Very soon it will be one year we've been doing this and there's no solution and there's no, uh, uh, no healing. Is there no balm in Gilead? And the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is still mighty and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is still powerful and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is still attracting attention in heaven and on earth. Hallelujah. And for, for the Lord has highly exalted that name and make it a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Hallelujah. To the glory of God the Father. Where are you? You said you were interested in revival. You're not praying like somebody that is really on fire for one. Yes, 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 yes. Talk to the Lord, talk to the Lord, talk to the Lord. Let heaven hear your voice. Repentance with remission must precede regeneration and revival. And those critical elements, the unity, are you an architect? The love, are you exhibiting the faith? Are you grounded? The holiness, are you a, a, a beneficiary? And proper doctrine? What's your attitude towards sound doctrine? Proficient preaching? Prevailing prayer? Why don't you pray as if you expect God to answer you? And we'll make the progress. It will continue. It won't die anymore. It won't die anymore. It won't go away anymore. Open your heart and talk to the Lord. Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start thy work in me, thy word declare, thou wilt supply a need. It's the need of revival. 
Oh, blessings now, oh, Lord, I humbly plead. Oh, Ghost. Revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start thy work in me. Thy word declares. Thou wilt supply a need for blessings now, O oh Lord, I humbly plead for Blessings now, O oh Lord, I humbly plead. Father, your church waits, O oh God, for your blessing. Father, your church waits, O oh God, for thy fullness. Father, we stand in great need, in great need of the rain, the former rain, the latter rain, the rain peculiar for this season, the rain peculiar for this season, the rain peculiar for the pandemic, the rain peculiar, oh God, for your church at this time, the rain peculiar for New York City, the rain peculiar for America. The rain peculiar for 2020. The rain peculiar for my generation. Oh God. Father. Send the rain. Send the rain. Send the rain. Brethren, let's pray. Like people that know how to beg. We are not qualified for anything good from God. But in mercy, he blesses. Let's ask him to do it now, dude. Hallelujah. 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 